Hello and welcome to this presentation on Adaptive Microsar, the current status and outlook for the year 2021. My name is Hannes Haas. Thank you for watching. In this presentation, we'll have first status of our current product development. We give an outlook on what's happening in the Otasar consortium and we'll dig in deeper into a couple of specific topics I have picked for you. What's the current status in our product development? Our Adaptive Microsoft product, Release 2, has been released and is used in several serial production projects. This was a major milestone for us this year. The Release 2 was based or is based on the 1803 standards plus a couple of project specific extensions in order to make the Odessa standard usable for our customers. Currently, we are working on our Release 3. It's based on the 18, 1903 standard of Autosarm and provides several functional increments such as time synchronization or certificate management. It also features lots of architectural improvements and runtime improvements of the overall stack. Currently, we are working on our QM release, which is scheduled for Q3 this year. Next year, we are aiming for an ACLD release in summer. This will be a major milestone for us because therefore we can provide customer the possibility to also have safety, critical, easy use using adaptive Microsar. When looking at the current layer architecture, we see clusters which are quite similar to what is defined in the Autosar standard. We have the COM cluster, which provides the ARCOM API, the middleware, featuring IPC communication, so easy internal communication. We have the SAMIP protocol, also known from classic Autosar, which allows external communication with other adaptive Autosar ECUs or with classic Autosar ECUs on Ethernet. SAMIP protocol can be protected using end-to-end -end protection for safe communication or using TLS for secure communication. We have the security cluster, which provides cryptographic routines and software or will allow the connection to hardware security modules, such as a vector VHSM solution. The persistency cluster allows storage of information in the file system, either key value based or on a file level. The log cluster provides logging on the console, the Autosart DLT protocol, which typically transmits messages on the Ethernet network, or file based logging. Logging provides you insight to what's happening in the basic software and your, your application. Execution Manager cares for process management, startup and shutdown. We have a time synchronization implementation on Ethernet, which is obviously also compatible to what's happening in the classic Autosar world. We have the PHM, which essentially controls watchdogs and takes care that the process order runtime constraints are kept. We have the diagnostic cluster with the DIAC module providing the possibility for UDS communication and also implements the fault memory management. For external communication, we implement the, the widely used IP protocol here. The state management is currently under development in Odosar and Vector is, great, is also participating in this specification. It will be very important when migrating to a later UCM updating strategy. Additionally, we are supporting the UDP NM as we also know it from the classic Odessa world, which features startup and shutdown state management of the network. Due to architectural reason, we are abstracting from the underlying operating system in order to make use of the best API choices possible for each operating system. Therefore, we provide OS abstraction layers for Linux, PyQS, and QNX. Outlook. So what's happening in Autosar and what's the current status here? Autosar pushes new releases every year. In the past, every release provided significant functional increase to the Autosar stack, which is important because it's a young standard gaining more functionality in order to allow wider usage. But also these new production releases introduced lots of architectural improvements. Some of them had been bug fixing. The compatibility between different Autosar versions was not a focus for so far. The problem here is that we have high migration efforts, first of all on our side, because we have to develop new basic software every time, but also on customer side, which have to adapt to the new RxML schema or to 
to the new C++ API. So it is hard to have a common platform which can be used to serve multiple, for example, OEM projects in case the OEM uses different Autosar versions. We hope that in future, Autosar will take care for more compatibility between the different Autosar versions. As Vector, we're trying to push also Autosar in this direction. Another discussion in Autosar is a formal interface definition. So what's the actual scope of the Autosar adaptive platform? Where does it end? On top, of course, we have the adaptive application. So that's out of scope. We have the platform itself. And on the lower end, we have the operating system. But we have also other drivers, such as a watchdog driver or a cryptographic routine provider, for example, for the HSM. And up to now, it was not clearly defined where and if there's a boundary. Now, in future, we hope it will be clearly defined that these kind of drivers, operating system, watchdog driver, cryptographic routine provider, will not be part of the adaptive platform. But we hope that there will be a standardized API, which allows attaching third party or also drivers developed by Vector, depending on the overall use cases, um, with a standardized API to the overall adaptive platform. Having standardized APIs here will provide more robustness and more flexibility because, well, hardware providers, for example, can provide standardized drivers for their hardware, which then will be integrated, for example, by Vector to a overall package. When looking at the this year and also the next year, what are the main topics we will focus in our adaptive Microsoft development? First of all, we'll continue to improve the overall runtime performance of our ECU. Then, as said in the introduction, we'll have our QM and ASIL release for our 1903 release 3. But there will be also some significant, significant functional extensions. Signal to service and software update are two of the most significant extensions we'll see in the next year. We also support or we also consider supporting DXWorks because this is another operating system which is widely used. In addition, we plan to have a migration to the Autosan 2011 standard next year. Looking at focus topics, we think that safety is quite interesting. So how does our overall safety architecture look like, which we are aiming for, for having next year? In the adaptive environment, not all modules and clusters will be made safe and implement safety requirements the same way. Therefore, we have highlighted this, the aim, the goal we have for the next year. First of all, ARACOM will implement functional safety requirements, such as uh, not violating or not modifying the communication data. Therefore, they will be implemented in a safe way and implement required safety requirements. Same thing happens for persistency. The PHM, for example, the watchdog handling will also provide safety requirements. On requests, we gladly provide you more details on what these safety requirements are. On the other hand, we have the diagnostic module which can for sure be linked with safe applications in order to allow them, for example, to lock um, status information of DTCs, but the diagnostic module itself does not implement safety requirements. Therefore, we just provide freedom of interference. In a similar way, time synchronization is being rated. Of course, we also see the possibility for future extensions in order to provide more modules in a safe way. Now, what to do with safety? Of course, one big driver is autonomous driving. The SAE has different levels in order to rate the capability of a self-driving vehicle. SAE level zero is basically a QM stack. Faults are not safety rated. Uh, there are no, system, no safety system requirements available. In the middle, we have the so-called fail safe Topic. In this case, the driver has to take over in case of a system fault immediately. So the system must be able to de detect faults and hand over to the driver. So faults have not to be avoided or coped with, but have to be detected. 
On the other hand, where fail operational falls must be tolerable or being avoided. The functionality of the car, for example, speeding on the motorway, must be kept. It's however possible to degrade its capability, for example, to go to the halting line. The driver here in this case is, well, no longer a fallback option. So we see the demand towards safety increases here. When looking at our products, we first of all focus for the fail-safe with adaptive microsome. So this will be covered by our solution we are planning for next year. While fail operational use cases will be provided by the classic OLOSAP platform. When drawing up a very high-level system, we see or we could see imagining a typical architecture for autonomous driving. We have high performance microcontrollers which implement all the rich functionality which is based on adaptive microsome. Here we are fail safe. Here the nominal functionality and all the features are implemented. More towards the actual actuators, we have however also fail operational ECU which can take over in case the nominal functionality fails. Here classic microsa would be applied. One more interesting topic for the next year is the so-called signature service. When looking at Aracom today, it's based on service-oriented communication using service discovery and serialization of data using the SAMIP protocol. Both standards are widely used also in the classic environment, but there's also another more conventional way how data is being transmitted in some Ethernet topologies. These topologies have a static mapping of signals to PDUs, which is modeled in the system template. So also, for example, the CAN network operates the same way. We are mapping signals in a static way to messages and PDUs. In order to serialize data that way, Autosar has defined the signal to service cluster or signal to service functionality. It maps signals or group signals to events in the AREACOM API. This mapping is statically defined and also based, for example, on the signal layout defined in the system template. In the same way, also data can be serialized by mapping event data to signals or signal groups, maybe in different messages. Long-term outlook could be that this kind of connectivity can also be used to support other bus topologies such as the CAN bus. However, the focus of our first implementation will be Ethernet. Layer architecture-wise, this will allow the communication of classic Autosar COM signals, which are being transmitted using COM module, PDU router, Ethernet driver over the Ethernet network to the adaptive Autosar stack. Here we'll have a PDU dispatcher which will decide on how the data will be deserialized using the new signal to service deserialization or using some AP deserialization mechanism. When transmitting data, of course, the same thing will happen and the PDU dispatcher will then package the data appropriately. Signal to service therefore provide an additional interoperability between classic and adaptive systems. Also very interesting and demanded for the next future will be improvements in the software update process. The challenges in adaptive autos are lay at hand. We have high performance controllers, which host a large number of applications. The applications are, due to their complexity, developed very independent from each other and also independent of the basic software. There's also the need to introduce new functionality, including completely new applications after serial production using most likely over, -air, over the air updates. So there's a complete new dynamic in how software is being deployed on adaptive Autosar ECUs. Back to Autosar, we are currently defining required workflows and specifications here. The most important modules here is the UCM, which takes care for the actual update routine within one ECU, but also the state management, which takes care on application specific state handling, for example, when to start, when to stop an application, or 
even to answer the question, is an update of this application currently possible? We have to manage the basic software configuration because it can change after an update or with an update. And the overall installation and update process has to be defined, including considering how a complete vehicle, which includes several ECUs, classic and adaptive ECUs, can be updated in a coordinated way. One key term here is the so-called software cluster. A software cluster groups all processes which belong to the application here. It's self-contained. It also includes required basic software artifacts to make this software cluster work. And when talking about software update, you're always talking about this kind of software cluster here. It relates to an app which we can download with our smartphone from an app store. So software classes are deployed as so-called vehicle software packages. They include binary data, configuration data, and metadata, which control the update workflow. In a vehicle, there will be most likely also a new component, which is currently well called UCM master. The UCM master takes care to distribute software packages to different ECUs. So there will be an entry point, for example, using diagnostics, UDS, but also some wireless communication. And the communication data as a package will be provided with custom protocols to the ECU. The UCM master will then decide on how to handle different parts of this update scenario. Some updates will be related to other ECUs. Some parts of the update are intended for the local ECU where they will be managed by the UCM performing the actual update. The UCM installs, updates, and re therefore removes the software clusters on the local ECU level. Of course, it will also consider security checks before the update. I didn't introduce the software download handler here at the beginning. The software download handler implements this. Um, protocol specific and also typically OEM specific routines on how the software update is communicated and introduced to the ECU. It may invoke data compression, security algorithms, diff update algorithms, and so on. And we assume that there will be different software download handlers depending on how does diagnostic data enter the car, for example, using UDS, for example, end of line, or Wi-Fi, net, mobile networks, and so on. So there will be different protocols and different routines. Finally, some words on our DaVinci Adaptive Tool Suite. Our DaVinci Adaptive Tool Suite is a very good way in order to configure an adaptive Microsoft stack. They are neatly coupled, coupled these two products from Vector. And um, as you know, it maybe from classic world, also DaVinci Configurator 5, um, we provide a simple way of editing the RxML model. The DaVinci Adaptive Tool Suite provides code style guides, code style like editing capabilities using an IDL, but also features editors and wizard for the most common tasks. It operates natively on the RxML data model, but it provides significant abstraction from the complexity of the actual model. We highly recommend that you also have a look at our YouTube channels where we provide some nice videos on our product here. The highlights of the upcoming version, which is 2.4, being planned for September this year, is the availability of QVSAT editors for machine and process editing, for service deployment, and a diagnostic editor. In addition, we have updated the validation view which includes direct jump to the, to the model, but also provides solving actions, as you may, may know it from DaVinci Configurator 5 of the classic environment. Thank you for watching. If you have any sort of questions or also recommendations for the future, please get in touch with us. Goodbye.